All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live virtual presentation by McMaster University's Socrates Project. Though COVID-19 has forced the temporary closing of our buildings and the cancellation of many of our live events, we are determined to find ways to bring you these bring you discussions about the important topics of our time. My name is Katie Moise and I'll be moderating tonight's discussion. I'm a science journalist and assistant professor of science communication in McMaster School of Interdisciplinary Science. It is my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Laura Parker. Laura is an astronomer and professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at McMaster University. Her research interests could hardly be more grand. She studies how galaxies form and evolve. Tonight, she'll be taking us back in time to the early universe and introducing us to dark matter and dark energy at a time when we are all intensely focused on social distancing here on Earth. We hope this journey into space is a welcome retreat. Laura is going to kick us off with a 30 minute presentation. After that, I'll be leading a Q&A for about 20 minutes and then we'll take questions from the audience. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Laura, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks so much, Katie. I'm really happy to be here. So I'm going to share my slides in just a second, but I just want to take a moment before we start just to acknowledge that it's a real privilege to be here, uh, to have these discussions, to talk about what I'm going to talk about tonight, structure in the universe. But I think it's important to acknowledge that it's particularly a privilege right now to be able to be having these kinds of conversations when the world, frankly, is on fire. So we have all kinds of disruption due to COVID-19, but also due to ongoing police brutality against Black and Indigenous people. And I wanted to acknowledge that before I started. Okay, so with that, I will start sharing my screen. So Katie, I'll just get an okay from you that you can see that. Perfect, okay. So today I wanna to talk about patterns in the universe, structure in the universe. My title says complexity, but when I say complexity here, I don't really mean a mathematical definition. I just mean, how do we get complicated things? And as I'm gonna hopefully show you tonight, how do we get complicated things from pretty simple beginnings? And so, I want to start actually not with pictures from astronomy, but pictures from different length scales. So as someone with a physics background, I'm fascinated in structure in general. So why are there patterns in nature? Why do things have the shapes and the sizes that they have? So this is a picture not from a telescope, which is what I'm more used to, but a picture from a microscope. So this is an image of mold spores. And I look at this and I wonder, wow, why are they so round? And why are they all so similar in size? And what the heck is that structure on the surface? But I know enough to know that biology is much too complicated for me and that there's a function in these shapes as well. But if I think about other objects in nature that have interesting patterns that maybe I can hope to understand, we've got things like these beautiful clouds. And hopefully you can see these surf wave-like patterns in the clouds. This is due to some beautiful physics where we've got different fluids in the, in the atmosphere with different densities mixing and they give us these patterns. And so on all different length scales, we can see that there are patterns in nature. And I'm interested in trying to understand some of those patterns, but for me, I'm interested in much bigger scales. So if I take one more zoom out here in scale, this is now an image actually of the surface of Earth, one section of the surface of Earth in Spain. And you can spend hours yourself zooming around on Google Earth, finding all kinds of amazing structures from satellite images. And when I see this, I just wonder, you know, what is this length scale? And what are these different structures? And is there some physics maybe that could explain how we get this structure? So is there a balance of forces? What has led to this, this kind of patterning on the surface of Earth? So all of these questions fascinate me, but tonight we're gonna to talk about the, my area of expertise and some of the patterns I'm trying to understand, which is on even larger scales. And so I'm interested, as Katie mentioned, in galaxies and in things that are bigger than galaxies that we're gonna talk about today. So this is an image from uh, actually an amateur astronomer of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So this is the structure that we are a part of. We live in a solar system in the Milky Way galaxy. This galaxy is filled with stars and gas and dust that you can see, but it's actually hard to get an image of what our galaxy looks like overall because we're in the middle of it. 
And so we can actually learn more about galaxies by looking at external objects. So this is an external, another galaxy outside of our Milky Way. Our Milky Way looks a lot like this. It's kind of pancake shaped, so very thin in one direction and very big if you look at it face on. And when you see an image like this, what you're seeing is all the light from billions and billions of stars, all the light from gas and also from dust that is in this particular galaxy. And as an astronomer who studies galaxies, we can go out and see many of these and figure out that there's some commonality to what they look like. There are a lot of galaxies that have similar appearance to this one. And so there's clearly some physics at play. There's a reason why galaxies have the shapes they have, the colors they have. And in my research group, we try to understand that. So how do we build a galaxy that looks like this? And we try to understand not just galaxies today, but as I'm gonna talk about also objects in the past. But today I'm not gonna stop at this scale. We're gonna zoom out even further and we're gonna treat galaxies as objects we can use to trace out structures in the universe on even bigger scales. So this is an image from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is actually the largest survey of galaxies in the nearby universe ever done. So they took pictures of millions of galaxies. Remember, each galaxy is a huge collection of stars and gas and dust, and they took images of millions of these. And what you're seeing in this image, every single point is a galaxy, and you're looking at all the galaxies in two little wedges of space, one above and one below, and we are right at the origin. So the Milky Way in this diagram would be right at the center of the circle. And so these are all the galaxies in the night sky in these two patches of sky. And what I want you to see from this image is that the distribution of galaxies in the universe is not uniform. This is not a constant density of points everywhere. It's also not random. We have structure. And so galaxies are distributed, um, hopefully you can see in this image, kind of like a network. There's a web of structure. And so galaxies are tracing out this web-like structure. And so when you see this, the natural question is why? What leads galaxies to be distributed in this way in the universe and not just randomly distributed? So there must be something at play that leads to structure on these very large scales. And that's one of the things we're going to try to understand tonight. And one thing we all need to know to understand the rest of the talk is that telescopes, like the ones we use in my research group, are actually time machines. So light travels at a finite speed. When something happens in the universe, we don't learn about it instantly. We have to wait for that light to reach us from whatever the object is. So even if right now in this beautiful evening, the sun stopped shining, we wouldn't know about it for eight minutes. It takes eight minutes for light to reach us from the sun. And in our own Milky Way, the very, very closest star to us outside of our solar system would take four years for light to reach us from the very closest star. And that's still very much in our own neighborhood. The galaxies I'm gonna show you in the next few slides, they're billions of light years away. So that's a lot of zeros. So we're seeing what they look like billions of years ago. And so by observing really far away galaxies, we can use this effect that it takes time for light to reach us to actually look back in time and to understand what the universe looked like when it was younger. And so this allows us not just to study structure in the universe today, but to study structure in the universe in the past and try to understand um, why the universe looks the way that it does. And so just to highlight one of the ways we do this, um, observing these distant galaxies, a popular tool to do this is to use uh, one of our most amazing telescopes, the Hubble Space Telescope, to image uh, a patch of sky. So the Hubble Space Telescope has the huge advantage that it's in space, takes clear pictures, uh, it takes beautiful images, it has the disadvantage of having a very small field of view. But if you want to wait a long time and get a really nice image of very far away things, you can point at one small patch of sky and open the shutter for a long time. So any of you who've done um, photography using a manual camera, you know if you open the shutter for a long time, you can do photographs at night, you can find faint objects. It's the same principle here, but we're opening the shutter on a camera on a two and a half meter telescope for more than 20 days. And if you do that, if you take this really long exposure, you get an image like this. Now, at first blush, this might not look incredibly interesting to just to look at this picture, just a bunch of colorful dots on, a, on an image. For someone like me, this is an incredibly exciting image. In this one picture, I have thousands of galaxies 
Most of them are actually billions of light years away, incredibly far away. And so this is going to allow me to use that time machine effect to figure out what galaxies looked like in the past and what structure in the universe looked like in the past. So this, this is the whole field of view from that patch of sky that was observed, but let's zoom in so you can see some detail. And so here, every little point of light, even the faintest little green or red smudge you see, every point of light here is a galaxy. And those galaxies are made up of each one about a hundred billion stars. So I apologize for all these big numbers. It's one of the things that goes along with being an astronomer. We, we get used to saying these really big numbers, but every one of these little points of light, every galaxy has about a hundred billion stars in it. And although not the focus of tonight's talk, I think it's, it's nice when you look at an image like this to put it in perspective that we know from our own studies around our neighborhood in the Milky Way, we know as of uh, 2020, that most of those stars have planets. So when you're looking at an image like this with a bunch of different galaxies, those galaxies are made up of 100 billion stars each, and most of those stars have planets. So if you wanted to ask me about whether there's life in the universe, it's not the subject of tonight's talk. And I don't really know the answer. I only know of life on Earth, but I know the statistics are in our favor, that there are an awful lot of places to look for, for life in the universe. So we can use the Hubble Space Telescope as a time machine to find ever more distant galaxies and figure out what the universe looked like when it was younger. So now I wanna put this in context of a timeline for the universe. And so this is my entire history of the universe in one slide. And what we have on the far left-hand side of this slide is today. So that's us today. Um, the universe, it turns out, today is 14 billion years old. So we have a couple of different ways of measuring that, but to uh, less than 10% uncertainty, the universe is 14 billion years old, and we have all those beautiful galaxies around us today. Then we can look out to more distant galaxies using the Hubble Space Telescope, and we can see back billions and billions of years. But we reach a limit where we can't see back further. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So the left-hand side are the galaxies we observe with telescopes today. The far right-hand side is the beginning of the universe. That's the Big Bang. And so I'm gonna define the Big Bang on our next slide. But the idea here is this is the beginning of the universe about 14 billion years ago. And the one thing you need to know for now about the Big Bang is that the universe started a finite time ago and it's been expanding ever since. And so we have a universe that started and has been expanding. And then today, on the extreme left-hand side, we have galaxies. So how are we gonna fill in some of these gaps between the beginning and what we can see with the Hubble Space Telescope? The first thing we're gonna do is next year, launch another telescope that's even more powerful than Hubble, uh, called the James Webb Space Telescope, which will allow us to peer back in time even further. And the most important new thing that the James Webb Space Telescope brings us is it's an infrared telescope. So light comes in all different wavelengths. We've got x-rays, ultraviolet, visible light that we can see with our eyes, and infrared. And there's an amazing property of an expanding universe. As the universe expands, any light in the universe, the wavelength of the light actually gets stretched out. So what I mean by that is, let's imagine you've got something in the universe that's shining with blue light. You've got a blue star giving off lots of blue light. That light, as it travels in an expanding universe, the light itself actually gets stretched out and it gets redder and redder. We call that redshift. And so as the universe expands, light gets redder and redder. And so if we wanna look back in time further and further, it turns out that the more distant an object is, the more the universe has expanded since that object emitted its light. And so the more redshifted the light will be. So that was a very long-winded explanation of why James Webb is so exciting. It's exciting because it's an infrared telescope. So it can see even more distant objects, objects that are so far away that their light has been totally shifted because of this redshifting effect into the infrared part of the spectrum. So the exciting thing about James Webb is we hope, maybe, we'll actually be able to find the very first stars and galaxies that lit up our universe. So the universe started a finite time ago, and it took some time before structures like stars and galaxies formed. And James Webb will hopefully be able to detect the very first ones. But we're not gonna stop there tonight. We're actually gonna go back in time even further. So the epic that I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about is when the universe was just a few hundred thousand years old. And so at this epic, the universe was very hot and very dense. 
And I think at this stage, it's important to define what I mean when I say the Big Bang. So this is a definition of the Big Bang from Jim Peebles. And Jim Peebles won the Nobel Prize in Physics just last year. Uh, born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, did most of his work at, at Princeton. But this is his definition of the Big Bang. That the universe is expanding and cooling is the essence of the Big Bang theory. You'll notice I have said nothing about an explosion. The Big Bang describes how our universe is evolving, not how it began. And so the point of this, um, this nuanced definition here is that the Big Bang is really a model that doesn't tell us exactly the instant when the universe came into being, how that happened, but it picks up the picture from that point and goes forward. And so from the beginning, and we don't know what brought about the beginning of the universe, but from that point onwards, the universe has been expanding, and as it expands, it cools. And so this allows us to imagine what would happen if you step back in time further and further. So today we live in a universe filled with stars and galaxies. If we go back in time, the whole universe is gonna be smaller and everything's gonna be closer together. And if I go back in time even further, I'll reach a point where there are no stars, there are no galaxies, there's just a sea of elementary particles. So the beginning of the universe is actually pretty simple. It's some light and some particles. And over time, those are going to turn into all the other structures we see. So I'm gonna fill in a few blanks on, on this early universe picture. And so I wanna go back to one very special epoch in the history of the universe. This is when the universe reached the age of 400,000 years old. So why is this age so important? This is the moment when this dense, hot early universe had expanded and cooled enough that all of the material in the universe went from being fully ionized to being neutral. So what does that mean? It means this is the epoch when atoms were formed. So an atom is made up of an atomic nucleus and some electrons orbiting around it. And at earlier times, closer to the beginning of the universe, the universe was too hot to have even atoms. So we had all these charged particles flying all around. And why that matters for this picture of the history of the universe is that light uh, interacts really strongly with ionized material. So light bounces all around. And the analogy here is that the early universe would have been like a foggy day. So if you go out in dense fog, you cannot see very far. Light bounces off of water droplets, does not travel in a straight line very long, so you can't see. And the early universe would have been the same. If you had been there, wouldn't recommend it, but if you had transported yourself to the early universe, you'd be surrounded in this bath of hot stuff and you wouldn't be able to see anything because the light would just be bouncing all around. Then suddenly the universe cools enough, it makes atoms, the light stops interacting with all the material and it just travels freely through the universe. And this light, because the universe has been expanding ever since, the wavelength of this light has been stretched and stretched and stretched and it's not visible, it's not infrared, it's really long wavelength light that we call microwaves. So if you can build a microwave telescope, you should be able to see this light from when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old. So of course, people have built microwave telescopes to do this. And to first order, this is what you get if you look at the entire night sky with a microwave telescope, this light turquoisey cyan color represents the microwave light that you would see. And so first detected in 1965 for part of the sky, and now we've measured it the whole sky from satellites, the microwave light we see, we see it all over the entire sky. It comes from everywhere because this epic in the history of the universe when it went from ionized to neutral happened everywhere at once. We see this microwave light and it looks remarkably the same everywhere in the universe. But we can build really sensitive detectors and zoom in and try to look for little tiny differences. Are there places where the microwave light is just a little bit redder or a little bit bluer than other places? And if you do that, you have a really careful observations, then this is the modern picture you get. This is from the Planck satellite. And this, again, for someone not in the field, just looks like some red and blue blobs, maybe not that interesting. But this is the baby picture of the universe. You can never get a picture of the universe from an earlier time. At earlier times, the light had no information. It just scattered constantly. You could not see the early universe was foggy. So here's the starting point for what we can ever possibly see about the universe. This is our baby picture. And those little blue and red spots you see are places where it's a little bit hotter or a little bit colder. And it turns out that those trace places that are a little bit more dense, a little bit more stuff, 
and places where there's a little bit less stuff. And those differences from the most dense to the least dense are one part in 100,000. So these fluctuations are tiny. Really, the map is almost perfectly smooth. It's only if you look really, really carefully that you can see these tiny fluctuations. And what's incredible is that these little places that are slightly over dense have a little bit more stuff. What gravity does is makes them over time more and more and more dense, heavier and heavier and heavier. And that's that at those locations that the first galaxies would form, the first stars and planets would form, and that's where we would form. And so the dense spots in this map are things that end up being structure like us. So I wanted to flash up this one slide. It's the most technical looking slide in my, uh, in my presentation, but I wanted to show you how beautiful the data are, which are the red points. This is a, a, a plot of the statistical properties of those red and blue splotches. So it's not nice enough just to see a picture of red and blue blobs, we have to analyze it. So this is the plot we use to analyze it. And what we're measuring are how big the, the fluctuations are as a function, so how strong the fluctuations are as a function of how big they are. So how many are there that are one degree in size or 10 degrees in size or 100 degrees in size on the sky? And this, the data here are in red. And the green line that goes through the data points is a model for the universe that has just six numbers in it. So this baby picture of the universe, which describes the statistical properties of all these red and blue blobs of microwave light, can be described with a model which has six things. And for the rest of the talk, there's three of them that are important. The amount of regular matter. By regular matter, I mean stuff like you and me, stuff made up of atoms the amount of something called dark matter that we're gonna talk about uh, in the rest of the talk, and then how fast the universe is expanding. And if I adjust any of those, those parameters, the model and the data will no longer agree. So if I crank up, I say, I don't believe there's dark matter. I think that all of the mass in the universe is made up of atoms like me. Crank up the amount of atoms and you will not be able to fit the beautiful data from this, this Planck satellite. So this is the baby picture of the universe, and this is the best fitting model that fits all of this data from the baby picture. But the takeaway is um, we have a universe that we can image with these microwave telescopes. We've got little tiny fluctuations, and the properties of those fluctuations, we can analyze them and figure out what are the ingredients of our universe? What are the ingredients we need to fit the data? And finally, I think what's most exciting is that those little tiny differences, the fact the map is not perfectly smooth but has little differences, get amplified over time to make structure in the universe. And so the takeaway from this baby picture of the universe is our universe is made up of three primary components. We have regular matter, only 5% of the universe is in regular matter. So I have it labeled here in the orangey yellow, so that's everything made out of atoms. That includes stars, planets, gas, people, everything we study in biology, chemistry, physics, all of that fits into 5% of the stuff in the universe. Most of the mass in the universe, the stuff that has gravity, is invisible to us. So we call that dark matter. Now, we have some ideas about what the dark matter might be. As an astronomer, what I can tell you is how much there is. In order to find it in the lab, you need to do different kinds of experiments than astronomers do. And then finally, the biggest piece of the, the stuff in the universe is actually something we call dark energy. And I'm not going to be able to do justice in the time I have remaining to fully explain what the dark energy is, but the, the thing to picture for dark energy is it's not like matter. It doesn't clump um, and have gravity like matter does. This dark energy is like a property of space itself. Every amount of space appears to have some amount of energy. So you can think about it as every piece of space has a spring in it. And that spring is causing the expansion of the universe to actually speed up. And as the universe gets bigger, there's more space, there's more springs. And so it actually expands faster and faster. And so this is a remarkable discovery that was only made uh, 20 years ago, and we're still fully digesting the fact that this is the crazy universe that we live in. So this pie diagram of describing the three major components of the universe, we can extract this from that baby picture. But it's also nice to actually go out and measure these things in the universe today and not just rely on this, this model fit to the early universe, which is beautiful and fabulous. But I study galaxies. And so I want to use galaxies to understand these, these different components of the universe as well. And so 
For the last few minutes, we're gonna use galaxies to try to understand the universe. And the analogy I want you to keep in your mind is this jar of candy. And so in this jar of candy, we have colored candies and the brightly colored candies are our galaxies. And the dark colored candies are the dark matter and the dark energy that we cannot directly observe. But we can figure out they're there by studying the galaxies. Just like with this jar of candy, if I took out all of the, the dark candy bean, can, jelly beans, the colored ones would fall to the bottom of the jar. You know that the black ones are there, even if you can't see them, because of the distribution of the colored candy. And that's the same idea in uh, the kinds of studies that we do using galaxies. We can study how many galaxies there are, how they move relative to each other, their distribution to figure out the stuff that we can't see. And so I want to particularly highlight one of the ways that we have detected this dark matter using galaxies. So now leaving behind the baby picture and using completely different ways of figuring out what makes up our universe and what gives us the patterns of structure we see in the universe. And so the example I want to give for measuring dark matter was the really important work in the 1970s of Vera Rubin. And this was critical because it actually convinced the world that galaxies are filled with dark matter. And so she measured how fast do stars and gas rotate in a galaxy. So everything's rotating in this galaxy. She measures how fast do things rotate and how does that depend on how far away you are from the center of the galaxy. And here's a nice image of Vera Rubin uh, doing her work. I cannot imagining, imagine doing this kind of work before we had digital cameras and high performance computers, but amazingly people did. And so another quick analogy here is we can think about, if you're wondering, what does it look like when stuff rotates? How do, how do I measure the speed at which something rotates? We can think about our own solar system, a little bit more familiar. We can make a plot of how fast do the planets rotate around the sun. And in a system like our solar system, where most of the mass is in the middle, the sun has most of the mass in our solar system, as you move away from the sun, you orbit slower and slower and slower. And we can thank Kepler for understanding this. And naively, we expected to see the same kind of thing for galaxies. Galaxies are really bright in the center, and they get fainter as you go away from the center. And so you would expect, perhaps, that if all of the stuff in a galaxy was the stuff you could see, then you would expect the same kind of trend, that as you go out in radius, you should orbit more slowly. The velocity should go down. Um, but just to show a real galaxy here, the data, this is a plot of how fast you're rotating versus how far away you are from the center. The data are shown in black, and the green line is the expectation you would get if this galaxy, all the mass in this galaxy, was just in the stuff that you could see. Then you would have the green line. But we don't, we have the black line. And that tells us there's a whole lot more mass in galaxies causing the stars and the gas to orbit really quickly. So if you just want to picture this, you've got stars orbiting really fast. If there wasn't a whole lot of mass there, those stars would just fly off into space. They're held into their galaxy because there's extra mass there that we can't see. So thanks to Vera Rubin and her collaborators, and also thanks to other measurements in the intervening years, we now know that when you see a galaxy like this, it's actually living in a much bigger structure. So the visible part of the galaxy is only a small fraction of the mass that's there. Most of the mass is in dark matter, and that dark matter extends out way beyond the visible galaxy. And through other kinds of measurements, we know the picture doesn't stop there, but these dark matter halos filled with galaxies build up into this network structure that we saw earlier. And so the large scale structure of our universe is dominated mostly by dark matter, and we're just seeing it traced out by the colored jelly beans that we can actually observe. But by studying how, where those jelly beans are and how they move relative to each other, we can actually figure out how much dark matter there must be that we can't directly observe. And so I just wanna finish with one quick mention of the dark energy that I um, am not gonna be able to do justice to, but it actually connects to this picture of the large scale structure and also to the idea of our telescopes as time machines. So what you're seeing here is actually a simulated view of the universe going from the early universe on the left hand side of the slide to today on the right hand side. And you're seeing the growth of structure. So what does this filamentary structure look like as the universe evolves? And amazingly, this is a really powerful probe of not just dark matter, but also dark energy. So remember I said dark energy is like energy in space that causes extra expansion. If you have a lot of dark energy, then it's going to make the expansion really speed up 
and it's going to lead to bigger empty regions in the universe over time. If you have less of that dark energy and more dark matter, gravity is going to win and things are going to clump together more and there's not going to be these big empty spaces. So by studying the, what this structure looks like, how many holes there are and how big the, the filaments and the web-like structure is as a function of time, we can actually measure this balance between dark matter and dark energy and how much of those things there are just by tracing out the locations of our colored uh, candy, our, our galaxies over time. So uh, to wrap up, this is what our universe looks like. It's a surprising picture, it's an amazing picture. But what I find really encouraging is that our baby picture view, which uses microwave telescopes and we studied the statistical properties of red and blue blobs, gives us exactly the same picture that we get by using galaxies to trace out the structure of the universe. We find the same answer. The universe is about 70% dark energy, about 25% dark matter, and about 5% regular stuff. And so huge answers here, but enormous questions remain. What exactly is the dark matter? What exactly is the dark energy? I'm sure people will have questions on those things, which I'm happy to address. Um, but once we know the answers to those, that's for sure Nobel Prizes in the, in the waiting. We'd like to know those answers. So I'll just finish by coming back to my title, which is um, how do we get structure in the universe, essentially? And the, the idea is you start with very simple particles at early times, simple and I say simple, but we don't actually know exactly what the dark matter is, but you've got some particles that don't interact with light. You've got some uh, regular particles like the uh, kinds of things that go into atoms and you've got an expanding universe. You put those pieces in at the beginning and you give it time. And even though it starts as being almost uniform density everywhere, there's just little tiny place to place fluctuations. You give that enough time and you give it gravity and you can explain large scale structure. So those simple ingredients plus gravity and time give you this filamentary structure. It also can help us even explain things on the scales of galaxies. But if you want to explain things on the scale of planets and the scale of people, there's a lot more to it. So those are much more complicated questions. But I think what's interesting is that we wouldn't be here. The only reason that we're here at all is because there's this baby picture where there's tiny fluctuations. If the early universe were actually perfectly uniform with no fluctuations, there had been nothing for gravity to amplify over time and we wouldn't be here. So it's precisely because of this baby picture that we're here. And I just wanna end, uh, leave a video on for a second in the background of, um, the fact that lots of structure in nature can come from simple beginnings. And so one of my favorite examples of this is actually looking at flocks of birds. So you've probably all been driving along the highway and seen these, these murmurations of starlings where you get these patterns of clumps of, of birds come together and then disappear and all these beautiful structures. And this can actually be described by a couple of simple rules of birds only interact with a certain number of neighbors near them. And if they all align, you get these amazing patterns. And so by looking at structures and patterns and things we see in nature, it's really fun to try to figure out are there some simple rules or some simple ingredients that could actually explain the behavior that we'll see. So I look at this on astronomical scales, but I encourage everyone to, to think about these things on all different length scales. So I'll stop there. Wow, um, that was awesome, incredible. Um, I love that you uh, said that and, and the start of your talk that biology was too complicated for you. <laughs> I, I think that's, um, that amused me. Um, because, and, and I see that you drew a lot of comparisons um, with biology as well. Um, you know, the telescopes and microscopes, um, even just your, your image of those galaxies that you showed, they looked like a confocal image from a microscope. There are so many comparisons. Um, to draw there. Um, as someone with a biology background, um, I know how biology experiments look, sort of how we, um, how, how, how scientists approach those. And I wonder if you can tell us um, how you study things like dark matter, um, how you begin to even try to detect that in labs using equipment here on Earth. Yeah, so so my expertise is much more on the astronomy side. So we, we design experiments by thinking about questions we can answer with data from telescopes. And then we apply to telescopes to get the data that we need. 
only, depending on the telescope, only maybe at Hubble, less than 10% of proposals are successful. Other telescopes, maybe 25% of proposals are, are successful. And then you can go and do your science and, and publish your amazing results. So what astronomers have found is that on all the scales we look at from galaxies on up, most of the mass in the universe looks like it's dark matter. And that gets people working in other areas of physics very excited, in particular, particle physicists. So when the evidence for dark matter first became clear, there were some competing theories. Could the dark matter just be stuff that's faint? So it's hard to see, but it's, it's kind of mundane. It's like regular stuff, it's just hard to see. Could it be things that emit at other wavelengths that we just didn't have the right telescopes to see? Uh, but the, the answer now we know for sure is that it cannot be regular matter that interacts with light at any wavelength. And so the best theory at the moment is that there is a particle that we have not yet detected in a particle physics lab that um, explains the dark matter. And that might sound like, you know, sure, you can just propose any new particle, but there are particles, natural things in theoretical particle physics that could explain this. And also we have other similar particles already. So some of you may have heard of neutrinos before. So there's a lot of important work on neutrinos that's been done in Canada in Sudbury at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. And in fact, the, the PI of that project, Art McDonald, uh, from Queens won the Nobel Prize in Physics a few years ago. Neutrinos are a lot like what we think dark matter might be, a particle that doesn't interact with light. The problem is neutrinos just aren't heavy enough to be the dark matter. There's, there's, they're not massive enough. But we think there might be something like a neutrino that's just a bit heavier. And so a whole lot of the experiments all around the world that were designed to look for neutrinos, like the ones in Sudbury, have pivoted and they're now being designed to look for dark matter. So, one of the techniques, just to briefly say how, how it might work, picture an atom. You've got a nucleus and you've got electrons going around it. Now, the nucleus turns out to be really, really, really tiny. And dark matter particles don't interact with light. So they don't care about the electrons. They're not scattering. They're not interacting the way that light would. But the dark matter particles, if they're there, every once in a while, one of them should directly hit the nucleus in your detector and impart a little bit of energy. And the particle physicists are so amazing, they can actually detect that. And so there's huge experiments being built with different materials, and they're trying to find when a dark matter particle directly hits the detector and gives, gives a particle a little kick, and they try to find that. So people in Italy are trying to do this, people in Canada, the US, all over the world. And whoever uh, manages to find the dark matter, is, is, uh, that's going to be a pretty exciting day. Yes. And it's not going to be done by an individual. It's going to be done by a massive team like many of these projects. Yes, so the, that leads nicely into my next question. So I can tell that um, that uh, I can just feel your genuine excitement about this. And when, when you talked about the baby picture of the universe and you showed us that um, that graph, uh, show, it's showing those um, the, the different variables, the, the matter and expansion rate, and just how beautiful that curve was, I can tell that that excites you. Um, and I wonder how often these moments happen in astronomy. Um, how often are there these sort of these images that come through that sort of just um, advance your understanding of something in that way? Um, so I think, I mean, I think in general, eureka moments that you have a totally new understanding are pretty rare in science. And in fact, I think it's almost dangerous to expect that. I think almost everything we do is incremental. So even that, that, uh, that beautiful data and the beautiful curve, I'm so excited that it fits so well. But pe teams were working on that for years and we knew what we were going to plot. And, and so it's not truly a eureka moment, but I think uh, maybe to answer your question slightly differently, I feel really lucky that every day, along with my students, we get to work on projects about galaxies in the universe. And if you do ever feel bogged down and things aren't working, all we have to do in my research group is load up some images of the galaxies. So instead of working with big data tables and doing plots, and which is what we do most of the time, which maybe you're getting frustrated with, just look at some of those galaxies. And remember that every time you do, you're seeing like 100 billion stars, billions of planets. You're probably looking at some alien life and you don't know it. So having that perspective of what it is we're actually studying, I think is a good thing to sometimes sit back and, and remember how cool it is, the, the kind of data that you're working with. It is so cool. I want to um, talk a little bit about, well, I guess, 
I guess, both dark matter and dark energy. Um, I've heard more about dark, dark matter before. Um, dark energy is sort of new to me. And um, I, I wonder what this energy could be. You said there are some ideas. Um, I wonder if you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah, so the, the idea of dark energy is, as I said, there's this energy, it appears to be this energy in space that's making space uh, expand at a faster rate, accelerated rate. And there are kind of two classes of theories for what that could be. One of them is called a cosmological constant. And the idea there is that every bit of space just has some amount of energy. More space, more energy, and it scales exactly. So you have a constant density of this dark energy in space. And the alternative to that is that you have something that's not constant, <laughs> something that evolves. And so the next generation of major observational projects, this is their key goal, is to measure the expansion rate, not just today, but at different epochs, and try to figure out, could it be due to a constant energy in space, which is consistent with all the measurements today, or do we need something that changes in time? And so we don't have the answer yet. What I can tell you today is that all the data is consistent with a constant energy in space, this cosmological constant, which actually that idea dates all the way back to Albert Einstein, amazingly. So it's not a new idea, um, but this is new evidence for this cosmological constant. And so what would be really exciting to people who study theoretical physics is if it's not that. That's a little bit boring. That's just like, okay, there's a, there's a minimum amount of energy that every unit of space in the universe has. And okay, interesting, but then you're done. You've answered the question. They're just, it just is. Every unit of space has some amount of energy. If it's something that is dynamic and changes over the history of the universe, that would be new physics. That could be like a new force of nature. Right now, we know of in all of physics, some of you may have studied physics, you learn about all these different forces. They are all manifestations of only four fundamental forces. There's gravity, there's electromagnetism, which is where we talk about when we talk about light, electromagnetism. And then there are two forces that are, have to do with nuclear physics. That's it. Every other force you've ever heard about in any other, any physics course is a manifestation of those four fundamental forces. If dark energy is not a constant, it could be something like a new force. And that would be really, really exciting. But there's no evidence of that at the moment. <laughs> um. Do you think this will happen in our lifetime that we will learn about dark energy? Yeah. So my, let me tell you my, my worst fear, which is everything's consistent with a cosmological constant. And the way that these measurements work is you go out and you do a huge survey, maybe with hundreds of collaborators all over the world, because you need enormous amounts of data and you need a lot of people to work on the data to answer these questions. And you do your measurement and you say, it's consistent with the constant plus or minus 5%. And then the next generation of experiments goes out and says, it's consistent with constant plus or minus 3% or plus or minus 1%. So we're narrowing in, but we're always gonna have some level of uncertainty. So you could always have some sneaky model that looks like a constant and you're just not able to detect it. If there's something that diverges strongly from this model of being a constant, then I will find it in the next 20 years. So the experiments are, we, we are, they're already planned. There are telescopes coming online that will do this measurement much better than has been done before, this measuring this growth of structure over time. And so if it really is not a constant by a lot, then, then we'll find it. That's exciting. Um, you, you talk about new microscope or telescopes, I'm sorry, coming online. Um, what will, uh, astronomers in the future see, I guess, when they look up into the sky with um, the technology they have and um, the way the sky may be changing. Yeah, so I think one thing that's really fun to, to think about is the fact that we live at an epic right now where the night sky is filled with galaxies. And we use, in my analogy, we use galaxies to trace out structure. So the reason that we have figured out we live in a universe filled with dark matter and dark energy is because we can see galaxies. If we didn't see gal other galaxies, we wouldn't be able to do Vera Rubin's method of measuring how fast they spin, and we wouldn't be able to trace out the structure. And it turns out that if you're an astronomer 10 billion years in the future, 
this dark energy is causing all of space, all of the, the um, distances between things to get bigger, faster and faster. And so galaxies are being spread out from each other in time. So if you're an astronomer in the distant future, you would look up at the night sky and only see the stars within your own galaxy. All of the other galaxies would have accelerated away out of your observable part of the universe. And I know that's a bit mind blowing, but right now we can see billions of other galaxies. Some future astronomer, if this dark energy is, is doing what it appears to be doing and just driving structure away from each other, then an uh, astronomer in the future wouldn't be able to figure out that they live in a universe filled with dark energy. Hmm. That, that makes me sad to think about <laughs> not being able to see other galaxies. Um, you use so many analogies and they're, they're so effective in, um, in delivering these concepts that are, that are really big and grand and I think hard, at least for me to wrap my head around. Um, how important is that sort of connect those, how important are those analogies in your field um, both to communicating your research and to just understanding and making sense of what you're seeing in the data. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think they're critical for astronomical things. We use the word astronomical in our everyday vernacular to talk about things that we are hard to comprehend or are so big you can't possibly wrap your mind around. And, and that's true even for those, who, those of us who work in the field. I can't picture what 100 billion of anything really looks like. I know what the number looks like, but it's hard to really visualize. So I think these analogies help, certainly help in education. And so I use them a lot in teaching, but they help for me too, to, to picture what things are like. So I gave the, the analogy of the light in the early universe bouncing around as being like a foggy day, but that's really what, what it's like. I mean, just to take that picture a little bit further, I told you that the sun is eight, uh, light minutes away from us. So if the sun burned out right now, we wouldn't learn about it for, for eight minutes. That was a bit of a simplification. Turns out the sun is this big ball of fully ionized gas. So the light that we get from the sun was actually made a million years ago in the center of the sun. And it took a million years to scatter around and then it makes, made it to the surface and then in eight minutes it makes it to us. So that analogy of a foggy day can come into play in a couple of different places and I think is, is really useful. Mm -hmm. And your jelly bean jar as well. With. I, sh I should have brought my real one. I have one in the pantry. I made one once just for fun. I went to uh, the party store and bought the right proportions <laughs> of colored candies and, and black candies and made a, made a jar because I find it such a useful description. Right yeah. away you can picture if you take away the black candy the colored candy falls to the bottom of the jar. You know it's there. Yes, that's awesome. Um, what, um, what do you say to someone who asks um, why you study space? Is there, is there so, some um, event that got you really excited about space or is there something, um, is anyone ever um, curious about why you study space and not something like medicine, and I wonder how you answer those questions if, if you ever get them. Yeah, I have had that question before. So, I mean, the classic answer when you ask a lot of astronomers, why are you an astronomer? A lot of people have been fascinated by the night skies since they were young. They read a lot of science fiction. They loved these questions. I'm not exactly in that mold, but for me, the, the critical piece, like for many people deciding what their future is, I had an amazing teacher. So I was uh, a, a student who was strong in math and science, and I started in a liberal arts degree in university, and I wasn't sure which path I was gonna take, and I had an absolutely outstanding physics and astronomy professor. And that's why I chose that direction. He gave me a research opportunity, and I loved it. And so it's the, another classic example of just having an amazing teacher. But then in answer to the second part of your question, you know, why do it? Well, I think it's fundamental science. If you're interested in understanding the world and the world around you, then this is really fundamental, understanding our universe, where it came from, where it's going. I love those big questions. And some people might think those big questions are really impractical or not useful, but, and I should preface this with, this is not why I do it. I do it because I find it interesting, but doing this research requires really cutting edge technology. If you wanna study the faintest objects in the universe, the furthest away things imaginable, 
you need absolutely amazing detectors. You need them in the optical, you need them in the x-ray, you need them in the infrared. And so cutting edge technology to use in scientific laboratories like at telescopes will 20 years from now end up in consumer products. So just as a classic example of that, we all have digital cameras in our pockets and our cell phones. Those digital cameras were really, uh, the CCDs that are in digital cameras were really developed and advanced for astronomical applications first. So they show up at a telescope or there's other technologies that show up in a chemistry lab or a physics lab to do really fundamental work. And then because they're amazing, then 10 or 20 years later, they might end up in a, in a consumer product. Awesome. So fascinating. I, so I have a couple more questions, um, more related to life as an astronomer. Um, and then we're going to open it up to questions um, from the audience. I, I just want to remind everyone to please type your questions into the Q&A on Zoom rather than the chat. Um, just so that I can see them all in one place. Um, so if you have already sent one in the chat, please just uh, open up the Q&A and paste it over there. Um, you mentioned as, um, where you, you touched on um, uh, getting microscope time um, and, and that discoveries in astronomy won't be done by individuals, but will be rather these, uh, or, or even in particle physics, will be the work of um, large teams. And I wonder if um, you can return to that for a moment and just describe um, how, how you get the data, where does it come from, how do you access it, how collaborative is observational astronomy as well? Yeah, so for answering some of these big questions about dark matter and dark energy, there's no way that any individual person could get enough time on any world facility uh, telescope. So we have the best telescopes in the world are located only in a few places. So in Chile, there's a couple of places in the US. Most importantly, though, Mauna Kea in Hawaii is the, the best site in the world for astronomy. Um, and then we have some telescopes in space that are, that are satellites. And it's incredibly competitive to get time on those telescopes. And so if you wanna do a really big project, you have to have a big team that joins together and all asks for a lot of time. And these days we also even sometimes build a telescope specifically for a project. So I started my talk with the, this slice of the sky um, above and below with all these points that represented galaxies. That was, a, that was data from a telescope called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope. That was built to do that project. So it was purpose-built. Most of our telescopes, you apply for a time to do all different science projects. And if you want to do something big, you have to have a, a big team that applies. But I will say in my research group, we also ask a lot of little questions. So we're not always trying to understand, you know, where did it all come from? Sometimes we want to know, why does that galaxy look like that? Does it have a big black hole in the middle that's doing something? Do, did it have some uh, collision with another galaxy? We have a much more specific targeted question. And for those kind of questions, we can work on really small teams. So I often write small telescope proposals for one or two nights on a telescope with my graduate students. And for those kind of projects, then you don't need to have these big teams. So I think what's really nice is you can find the space that works for you. If you're someone who likes to be part of a big collaboration, there's a lot of opportunities. If, there, if you like to have your own projects, you can do that, or you can do a blend of the two. So there's, I think there's room for different kinds of, of working preferences and styles among astronomers. Okay. And when the data come out from those big projects, what is that like on those days when that data is released? Is it just like... Ah, so uneventful because it usually trickles in. So oh. in, when I was a graduate student, when you applied for telescope time, if you were successful, then you would, six months in the future, you'd, you'd find out you were successful and then you would have a date to go to the telescope, maybe six months in the future or so. You'd book yourself a plane ticket, you'd fly off to Chile or Hawaii or wherever you were going to get your data. And while that was wonderful as a grad student to travel the world, it came with uh, major expenses of traveling. And then also, if it happened to be cloudy, which happens on the night that you're supposed to get your data, then you would get nothing. Uh, there's now, most telescopes have a system where the top ranked proposals are taken by professional astronomers at the site when the conditions are right. So if you had a really good idea and, and uh, a peer review panel said, this, this should get data, then they'll take the data at the telescope on the night that is perfect for your project. 
And then often that happens over some period of time for you to get all of your data. So you'll get an email. We took some of your data last night and then you get another email a month later and here's some more. And then you just transfer it over the internet. And so it, it's often more of a trickle than a, than a, a huge amount of data all at once. Okay. Thank you. And then this is going to be the last question from me. Um, the physical sciences have traditionally not had a large proportion of women. Um, I wonder if this is improving um, and what the challenges, what are some of the challenges that you faced as a woman in physics and astronomy? Mm, good question. So certainly things have uh, improved to some sort of compared to some historical number of what the proportion was like. So the proportion of women in astronomy is higher than the proportion of women in physics in general. So there are more women in, in the astronomy part of physics than the rest. Um, but still nowhere near parity. So there are other areas of science where there's a much, much uh, better gender balance. Uh, and so this remains a problem. I would say that the numbers improved, the percentage improved maybe 20 years ago and it's kind of stagnated. And the, the problem goes back to a younger age. So women who are successful in getting their PhDs in astronomy tend to be successful in getting postdocs, tend to be successful in getting faculty positions at the right proportion. So sometimes you, you may have heard of this uh, leaky pipeline. So a pipeline is you go from one stage of your career to the next to the next. So the question is, where do people exit out? And for women in physics and astronomy, they're not exiting out at these advanced stages. They're actually never getting into the pipeline. And so the proportion of women in physics undergraduate programs is really low. And so I think our barriers are really uh, trying to convince people to come in to, to studying the physical sciences in the first place. And I mean, in part, it must be, it's on us to do better marketing to explain what you can do with a degree in physics and astronomy. Not everyone's gonna go off and be a professional astronomer, but the skills you get by studying physics and astronomy, we do big data analysis on huge data sets. We uh, do image analysis. A lot of those kinds of skills are highly transferable. And I think it's up to us to do a better job of communicating that. And I did want to point out too that uh, our gender diversity has improved over time, um, but diversity along other vectors is also still really poor. So when I teach a large introductory class, I have a very diverse uh, student population at McMaster. When I am teaching students in advanced physics courses or in graduate school, that diversity has really fallen off um, in other vectors of diversity, not just gender. And so I think there's definitely room for improvement and many of us are, are working really hard on this and, and thinking about um, all kinds of initiatives we can do to improve diversity overall. And I guess the last part of your question was barriers that I faced. I'm, I'm lucky that there were people who went before me. And so I had, there are people who, who built a path. I, I referred to Vera Rubin um, and her amazing work. So she faced barriers of even being able to go to a telescope. Women couldn't do that. Certainly not up all night doing, taking science data. That was ridiculous. So times have changed. There's no problem going to a telescope, but there are little kinds of, of um, harassment that that I certainly have faced along the way and comments which uh, are inappropriate. And what I try to do is talk about those things openly within my own research group um, so that we don't perpetuate the kind of attitudes and behaviors that have been there in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, I am now turning uh, my attention over to the Q&A. So once again, if you do have a question, please um, put it in the Q&A section of Zoom and I'm gonna, um, get through as many of these as we can. We do have quite a few questions. Um, so the first one is at the start of the universe when there was just elementary particles and light, where did the light come from? Oh, such a good question. So if we go back in time even further towards the Big Bang, we had uh, um, another epic. So I started when the universe was a few hundred thousand years old. So I left out some pretty key things that happen at even earlier times. And one of those key things is the formation of matter itself. So the, where did all those particles come from? And that, in fact, answers the question of where did the light come from? So at some point in the early universe, there was, we're right after the Big Bang, we have tons of energy from this, whatever brought the universe into being. There's a lot of energy there. That energy went into making particles. And we know about this process through Einstein's work, E equals mc squared. You can turn energy into to mass particles. But when you do that, you make things, 
you make pairs of particles, regular matter like us, made up of electrons and, and protons and things, and you make antimatter, which is matter that has the same mass but the, the opposite charge, and you make them in equal amounts. And so we would have expected in the early universe, lots of energy, you make matter, you make antimatter, and if matter and antimatter get close together, they actually annihilate each other and they make light. So they, that energy is turned into light. So we expect, naively, one would have expected the whole universe to come into being, make matter and antimatter, they collide and you've got light. And then the universe should just be filled with light and we shouldn't be here at all. So one of the huge fundamental questions in particle physics is why are we here? Which the, what, what resulted in that is this matter and antimatter, there was just a little bit more matter than antimatter. So when they collided, then your antimatter's gone, tiny bit of matter left over, and a whole bunch of light. So where that light came from is from this earlier phase in the history of the universe. Okay, um, another question. You mentioned redshift as a result of expansion of the universe. How is this related to the frequency change Doppler effect of light sources traveling away from us? Is this the same effect? Yeah, so the, there are a couple of different kinds of redshift, um, three, I think, kinds of redshift uh, in astronomy we can think about. One of them is the Doppler shift of things moving towards us or away from us. And so we can see this, for example, when we look at even stars in the Milky Way, those that are coming towards us or away from us will have their spectrum shifted to the, to the red or the blue. So that's a, that's a motion, that's Doppler shift. And then we have a, a kind of redshift due to gravity when you're near extreme objects like black holes. So I'm gonna leave that out because we didn't talk about black holes today. And then we have the redshift I was talking about that when the universe expands, the wavelength of light gets stretched out. Now what's confusing is when you read an introductory physics uh, or astronomy textbook, they often say galaxies moving away from us, therefore it's redshift because they're moving away. And that's because people understand the Doppler shift. You understand that when an ambulance siren drives away from you, the frequency changes. And so people often describe galaxies moving away, you get a Doppler shift of the light. But that's not really strictly true. What's really happening is that space is actually being expanded is actually, and the wavelength of light is being stretched. So in an introductory book, they might explain it as the galaxy moving away from us. But what's really happening, the, the redshift of the light is not due to motion. It's not the galaxy moving, it's actually space stretching between us and that galaxy. And that's what's stretching out the wavelength of light. Okay. Um, I see a few questions about dark matter and just, uh, so does dark matter have mass and or gravity? Both. So the, the big difference between regular matter and dark matter is regular matter has mass and it interacts with light through the electromagnetic force. Dark matter has mass, therefore has gravity, but it doesn't interact with light, so we can't see it. So they behave exactly the same way under gravity. It's just one we can see and one we can't. Awesome. How do galaxies interact when they are all swirling around the center? So galaxies, each galaxy is rotating about its own center but we have other galaxies nearby in space sometimes. And I'm not sure if I'm completely answering this question, but galaxies that get close enough together, if they feel each other's gravity strongly enough, they will actually merge. And so that's a whole other interesting thing you can study is what happens when two galaxies get close enough that they can actually merge and make a bigger galaxy. So amazingly, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is on a collision course with Andromeda. Uh, the nearest big spiral galaxy to us. So those of you who know your night sky know that you can see, even without a telescope, you can see faintly the Andromeda galaxy in the summer. So Andromeda and the Milky Way are on a collision course for each other. And we are both these nice spiral rotating galaxies. When we smash together in the future, it's going to randomize all the stars and gas and dust. And it's no longer gonna be these two nice rotating galaxies. We're gonna live in a big blob <laughs> that we call an elliptical galaxy. So we'll no longer be like a pancake. We're gonna be a big ball in the future. So swirling galaxies get close together, they'll actually merge and make a bigger galaxy. Do you have a sense of when that is? When oh happens? yes, we know exactly when that is. And I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's on the order of about 4 billion years. Okay. Um, but 
plus or minus a little bit. I can't remember. Awesome. Um, a couple questions about dark energy too, and just wanting some mm -hmm. elaboration on that. Um, can you tell us more and how is it different from regular energy? Yeah, so it seems to be a property of space itself. Um, and so other kinds of energy you have, kinetic energy, thermal energy, you have energy that can be exchanged in different ways. This does not seem to be, this seems to be a property of space itself. You get more space, you get more of it. So one of the first things we teach students in physics is that you must always conserve energy. So for those of you who have never taken physics, I apologize. For those of you who try to forget it, I apologize. But this is one of the fundamental principles of, of first year physics. So you might have heard of the words kinetic and potential energy before. If something gains kinetic energy or motion, it must lose potential energy. So you have to always have a balance of energy. Dark energy is not like that at all. You have more space, you have a bigger universe, you have more energy. It's a property of space, so it's not conserved. As the universe gets bigger, we have just more volume, we have more dark energy. So the next question that you should ask me when I say that is where's the energy come from? Can't tell you, it seems to be a property of space. Each unit of space has some unit of energy. And that's very mind blowing and uncomfortable for people who are used to thinking about everything must be conserved. Um, and so in an expanding universe like the one we have, those conservation laws are, are more complicated. Okay, um, this is a long one, I'm gonna read it. Um, just as quantum physics represents a sort of leap from classical or Newtonian physics and requires a completely new take on the world with differences in rules, is it possible to go from understanding regular matter to understanding dark matter? Is it possible that to go from understanding regular matter to understanding dark matter might require a new threshold, a new kind of understanding with different rules, etc.? Yeah, I think that's a totally fair question and absolutely possible. And one of the reasons why it's so important to find evidence for dark matter in the laboratory is so that we can constrain all of the different theoretical possibilities that exist right now. Because exactly as the question suggests, you could have a whole new way of thinking about particle physics that is just beyond our current understanding and dark matter just falls out of that naturally if you have this new way of thinking. And so there are people who work on all different theories of what the dark matter might be and some of them are really sort of fundamentally different kinds of interactions that we have not yet observed uh, between particles. And so it's why we're all just anxiously awaiting um, any positive detection. Mm -hmm. It's really fun to think about how these big detectors work and how would you know that you have found it? Because there's lots of things that could hit particles. Um, how do you know you found dark matter? And so one little piece just to add to that, uh, how those experiments work. So we live in the solar system and the solar system is orbiting around in our galaxy. But during the year, the, the earth is orbiting around the sun. And so as we, in our galaxy, we're rotating and the, the solar system's rotating, um, the Earth's rotating around the sun. As we are moving within the Milky Way, we should actually be moving through the dark matter. So one of the things I didn't get to talk about is the fact that galaxies live within these much larger structures. The galaxies have a lot more spin. They're moving, the structure within the visible galaxy is moving quickly. The dark matter we think is not. And so if we're moving through a sea of dark matter, then part of the year, we'll be moving faster compared to another part of the year. So when the Earth and the Sun are moving together around the galaxy versus when the Earth's moving in the other part of its orbit. So what that means in terms of these experiments means you should find more dark matter part of the year, less dark matter, and it should have this repeating pattern. And so to convince people that you have actually found a signature of dark matter and not something more mundane, you should see this cyclic pattern. And so that's what a lot of the experiments are looking for, is positive detections that follow this, this cycle as we orbit around the sun. Hmm. Um, so that there, there is another question that is, is there dark matter around us here on Earth? Yeah, so the one of the important properties of uh, that differentiates dark matter and regular matter, as I mentioned, is that regular matter interacts with light. Why that is so important for the scale of galaxies is, I showed you this huge dark matter halo and a galaxy in the middle. Why is all the regular matter in the middle? The reason all the regular matter is in the middle is that regular matter can give off light, and that means giving off energy, 
and shrink to a smaller size. So within a dark matter halo, if the regular matter was everywhere, eventually it would sink to the center by radiating light, it would give off energy and it would shrink to the middle of that dark matter halo and that's what we see. Dark matter has no way to give off energy and shrink to a smaller size. And what that means is that although there's dark matter around us, the density is not that high because it has no way to give off energy and shrink to a smaller size and get to really high densities. So it's not like there's a crazy amount of dark matter, but depending on exactly what the dark matter particle is, the predictions would be in one second, there's somewhere between a million and a billion of them passing through your body. So that's not a very high flux for some kind of particles, but it's still pretty remarkable that if we're right about all of this, that it is a particle that describes this extra mass that we detect. If it is a particle, then there's some of them passing through your body right now. Hmm. Um, all right, switching gears uh, to, to bigger things now. Why are galaxies, solar systems, et cetera, relatively flat? Is there a reason that these structures made of spherical objects have a preferential axis of rotation. The Hubble mm -hmm. image looked like the alignment of the planes of galaxies was somewhat random. Is this the case? Yeah, so the, I'll answer the second part first and I'll go back to the first part. The second part, the Hubble deep field image with all the different galaxies, that's a flat two dimensional picture, but those galaxies are all at vastly different distances along the line of sight. So they're physically not connected at all. And so the galaxies would just have random orientations. Some of them you're seeing edge on, some face on, some of them are round to begin with because they've already maybe had two galaxies that collided and made a round object. So you're just seeing a random projection when you see a thousand galaxies like that. This, the first part of the question was about why do they all seem to be in a plane? Um, why do they have that shape? Why do solar systems, why do galaxies have that pancake kind of shape? And that is, that's well understood physics and it has to do with spin. And so anytime you have material that starts out in a ball and collapses under gravity, and it turns out that's how stars form, and also that's how galaxies form, you've got material that's more extended, and then gravity is winning and the material starts to collapse. If it had any rotation at all, even a tiny bit when it was big, as it collapses, it spins faster and faster and faster, and it naturally makes a disk. And so that the principle, what's happening there is called the conservation of angular momentum. And it is precisely the same thing as when a figure skater is skating and they draw in their arms and they spin faster and faster, same principle. So material that's forming a solar system or forming a galaxy, as it collapses, it, it conserves the amount of spin it has, but it's getting smaller. So it spins faster and faster. Okay. Is there a concentration of dark matter at the center of our galaxy? Excellent question. And so a uh, short answer is yes, we know that dark matter has what we call a density profile. So in the center of galaxies, there's more dark matter and it falls off with radius. It's just that it doesn't fall off as quickly as the light. So it keeps going out further. But this has been a major question for the last few decades is exactly what is the density of dark matter in close to the center of galaxies. And if you take a bunch of particles and you run a simulation and you say, what would I expect it to be? So I understand gravity. I can put a bunch of particles in a box. They don't interact with light. So it's really simple. It's just gravity. What do I get for a dark matter halo? And you find that the inner density just keeps going up and up and up. And we call that a cusp, it's a sharp in inner density. And then when we go out and try to measure this uh, in real galaxies, the density doesn't keep going up and up. It's kind of flat in the middle. So the dark matter seems to have a flat density profile in the middle and then it, then it falls off with radius. And the reason for that is something that lots of people work on, including researchers here at McMaster. And it turns out that if you just put a bunch of particles in a box, you're missing out on the fact that regular matter does interact with light and is more complicated. So if you add to those particles in a box, a bunch of real stars, that blow up as supernovae and have all kinds of interesting stellar evolution, you can actually destroy that steep density in the middle and make it flat. And so the interaction of regular matter and dark matter is enough in the middle of galaxies to change the density profile. So to, to get rid of this high density peak in the middle. Okay. Is it reasonable to think that all the laws of physics can be discovered from the small spot of the universe that is Earth? 
we do the best we can. <laughs> I mean, fundamentally, we have our observable universe, and um, we develop theories that can describe all current observations. But as soon as we have an observation that doesn't agree with our theory, we know either our theory is wrong or, or it's incomplete, which is more often the case. And so I think we, don't, we never stop. We keep trying to collect more evidence and figuring out if there are pieces that we're missing. So right now, we know that the model of particle physics, which people in the 1970s might have thought was complete, is clearly not because there's no dark matter in it. Um, we know that theoretical physics is missing something because they don't naturally predict dark energy. Uh, and so that's, we keep doing observations and we keep adding to our theoretical understanding. Okay. Um, what are some of the most significant research projects regarding space and physics that are currently being um, happening at McMaster? Ah, at McMaster. So we have people who work on all different areas of astronomy ranging from planets and we have people working on uh, even origins of life which is not quite astronomy but thinking about finding planets outside of our solar system and trying to understand how they form and how they evolve. So that's a really big, exciting area of astronomy right now is the fact that we've had a revolution in the last 15 years where we went from having basically no planets known outside of the solar system to now having thousands. And once you have thousands, you can start to understand how common is the Earth? How common are systems that look like our solar system? What are planets look like out there in the universe? Where might there be life in the universe? We can start to ask those kind of questions. And then we have people uh, like me um, who work on galaxies, but not just from observational perspectives, which is what I do, but also from the simulation perspective. And that's actually a really nice strength in our department is that we have people who work on both simulations and theoretical work and the observational work. And I think it's a really healthy thing when you can talk to each other and not work in within your silo, but you can collaborate. So we have projects that combine multi-wavelength data and simulations. And that really allows you to understand the universe better. So I think historically, a lot of people had their favorite telescope, their favorite simulation, and, and you worked on your project. And very much now, it's we combine all of these different approaches. And I think you can learn a lot more that way. Awesome. So on the topic of this sort of um, interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, uh, do your projects necessitate a direct role in the development of technology and tools? And what types of collaborations do you engage in between disciplines? Hmm. So I uh, have to admit, not a lot of interdisciplinary um, collaborations with what I do. So it's pretty much pure astronomy. But where things are a little bit interdisciplinary is as the question started with on the technology side. Um, and so I've been quite involved in development of some instruments for some of the major telescopes. Uh, and so I don't build instruments myself. I don't have a lab that I do that. But I am involved in management of telescopes where we decide what's the next instrument um, to put on this telescope, which enables us to do the next big science. So when you build a telescope, you've got this huge mirror. But then you've got the cameras and all the different instruments and those you try to upgrade, you try to bring in new technology. So every couple of years you bring on new instruments for these telescopes. And that's the part where you get collaborations between people in different areas uh, of science, but then also within astronomy, but then also with engineers who are, who are working on, on building the instrumentation. And so there's a lot of astronomers who work on the boundary between science and instrumentation. I'm much more on the pure science side, but through my involvement in telescopes, I've been involved in some instrument projects. Okay, and do you need supercomputers to analyze your data? Uh, some of the projects do. So the, certainly on the big simulations, if you wanna simulate the universe from first principles where you've got decent enough resolution to actually make galaxies, but also get the large scale structure right, also get things like stars in there. You need supercomputers absolutely for that. But also some of the data from some of the brand new telescopes. Uh, for example, there's a, a big array of telescopes in Chile called ALMA, which is a radio telescope. And it's a bunch of different telescopes that all work together to synthesize uh, high resolution images um, at radio wavelengths. And that is complicated data. It's a huge, it's called interferometer, but it's many telescopes um, all working together. And the data requires uh, high performance computing uh, to, to, to reduce so you can actually use it and do, to do your analysis. So most of the graduate students who work in astronomy have some experience on working with 
data sets that require some level of high performance computing. Okay. Coming back to dark energy, mm -hmm. could you explain vacuum energy? Is it the same as dark energy? Yeah, so these are two different terms basically to describe the same thing. And so depending on what book you're reading or what article you're reading, they might use one term or the other. The way I like to think about it is dark energy is a good um, catch-all term, umbrella term. And then within that, there are different models. And so the models that are these um, varying things, so we have the constant model, cosmological constant, and then there's a whole bunch of other possibilities that are the varying kinds of dark energy. Those are often called vacuum energy. So the different theories for something that describes dark energy that is not a constant. So vacuum energy is energy in space. So when you think you have empty space, you have some amount of energy. And so that's the same principle that I was describing. It's just the models that evolve in time are often called vacuum energy. Okay. Do you relate any of the questions on dark matter to any possible other dimensions suggested by string theory? So um, string theory is a theory of what's called quantum gravity. So the amazing um, discoveries of 20th, early 20th century physics is, are descriptions of the very small things, quantum mechanics, and a new description of gravity through Einstein's theory of general relativity. And the challenge is that these are amazing things that work incredibly well, but they don't work together. Uh, and so one of the fundamental things, if you've read anything about quantum mechanics, is that at a fundamental level, we have uncertainty. So the whole world on qu the quantum scale is probabilistic. So let's imagine I've got two electrons really close together. I don't actually know exactly where they are. So how do I calculate gravity in that situation? So gravity, general relativity, and quantum mechanics don't talk nicely uh, to each other. And so this has led to almost a century of people trying to find a model that brings them together. And so generally we call those things theories of quantum gravity. String theory is by far the, the most popular, the most advanced of those theories of quantum gravity. Um, and all of these theories of quantum gravity, basically, they all have extra spatial dimensions. So what does that mean? We live in a universe that, ha that we know has three spatial dimensions. So X, Y, Z, or up and down, back and forth, left and right. Maybe there are extra spatial dimensions and maybe gravity hangs out in those extra spatial dimensions. Um, so that's the, kind of the idea behind some of these theories of quantum gravity. And one of the reasons why we think it might be important to have extra dimensions is it turns out gravity, although really important to everything I talked about today, gravity is actually a very weak force. And you know this because when you're sitting next to someone, you don't feel their gravitational pull. The only reason we feel gravity is because the earth is so big and the sun is so big. The force of gravity on the particle scale is ridiculously small. Uh, and so one explanation for why gravity might be such a weak force compared to the other forces is that it hides out in extra dimensions. So that's a, a beautiful theory that could describe quantum gravity, but at the moment there are no observational tests. And so as an observational astronomer, uh, I have basically nothing to say about, about string theory and extra dimensions. I think it's a super cool idea, um, but not something that I, that I can test. Okay. Um, will the expansion of the universe eventually hit a threshold and will things bounce back? Great question. So when I first started learning about cosmology, this was the, this was the, the big question. So the universe is expanding. Is it going to expand forever? Is it going to, is the gravity of all the stuff in the universe going to be enough that it expands, but eventually gravity wins and it all recollapses? And that was the picture we had when I first started learning about astronomy before the discovery of dark energy. So before we didn't know the expansion of the universe was speeding up. Now with the discovery of dark energy and we know more about the expansion of our universe, it is highly unlikely that it's going to recollapse. Gravity is not winning, gravity is losing. And so dark energy is taking over and as we have more space, we just have more dark energy. So the acceleration just continues. And so every expectation is that the universe is just going to expand away um, at an accelerating rate, not going to recollapse. And that is not what I learned when I first started uh, studying astronomy. We were in a much simpler time then when we didn't know about the existence of this accelerated expansion. So it was a simpler thing to balance expansion versus gravity because it was not accelerating. 
Yeah. Well, it was, we just didn't know it. Right. Um, I have a couple questions about the origins of gravity. How did gravity originate? I do not have an answer to that question. So gravity is one of the four fundamental forces of nature. What I can say is that uh, what I just said about a theory of quantum gravity, why people are so interested in trying to understand how do you get gravity and quantum mechanics to talk to each other is that at the very, very, very beginning of the universe, in less than a second after the Big Bang, we need something to describe the universe at that point. The universe was truly tiny. It was quantum mechanical in size, but gravity was really important. So we actually don't have a theory right now that can explain the very, very, very early universe. And that's where gravity originates. And so I think to answer this question, we really need to know what is the right model for quantum gravity? Because that's, that's really the origin in the very early universe. Okay, thank you. Um, we're gonna fit in a couple final questions. Um, you said that in the distant future, the objects seen in the night sky will be further apart. Would the night sky therefore be darker since there is more spacing between objects or will it be balanced out by light from stars that hasn't reached us yet in the present but is finally reaching Earth and will therefore be bright? Fabulous question. These are the kind of thought, ex thought uh, experiments which are really fun to try to wrap your brain around. Unfortunately, the expansion, again, is just going to win out. And so even though there are new objects coming into our observable universe now, things that we're just getting the light from now, that accelerated expansion is going to take most things within our observable universe and move them out. This just means less light. So we're just going to have less things to see and less light in the future. Okay. Um, and then one final question. Do you have a favorite sci-fi book and who <laughs> inspires you to pursue greatness in science? You mentioned an awesome teacher. Is there anyone else who has mm -hmm. inspired you? So I'm one of the anomalies in my field that I didn't read science fiction. <laughs> and so I don't have an answer to that question. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't read a lot of fantasy and sci-fi. So I always feel left out at those lunchtime <laughs> conversations. Uh, Heroes, um, I mean, I think in general, it's, it's good to have role models that, that, uh, that you can look up to. And I try not to have kind of heroes on a pedestal, but I, I think what most inspires me are people who run astronomy groups and collaborations in a really supportive way. So there are some, currently in, in astronomy, there are some leaders who are kind of quiet leaders that just really support the students and the postdocs that work for them. And they all go off and do great things. And you may not point to them and say, that's an Einstein, but actually is a lovely person who trained a whole bunch of people who are out doing amazing things. So I think what most inspires me are the fabulous supervisors um, who really have encouraged the students and postdocs that work with them to, to do interesting science and to go out and, and, uh, and work positively with other people. So I'm not gonna name anyone in, in particular, but that's more of my kind of, my kind of uh, hero. That's awesome. I, this was, this was, has been so wonderful to listen to you talk and I love your analogies. And I, I think you, your discussion about sort of the, the importance of those small anom anomalies in that pattern um, is, is just so awesome to think about and that it takes gravity and time. Um, for things to happen and for progress to happen. And um, I think there's an analogy uh, in there. Um, I wanna thank you, Dr. Parker, uh, so much for your time. I'd like to thank everyone um, for coming and, and listening. Um, I also just want to uh, draw your attention to um, an upcoming uh, um, talk again with the Socrates Project um, from crisis to complacency mapping public opinion during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this is coming up on June the 29th. Um, so I encourage you to check it, check it out and, and register for that if that is of interest to you. Um, thanks everyone once again. Thank you, Laura, so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Katie. Good night, everyone.